Yay! There she is, one of my all-time favorite people to talk to. And I, I don't say that to everybody. Dahlia Lithwick, hi. Hi. I mean, I say it to Eric Siegel sometimes, but... Tell Eric I say hi. <laughs> I will do that. That's a callback from our conversation before I hit record. Always a weird thing. Okay. I have a lot to talk with you about. I'm really happy that you're able to talk to me. First of all, I think you've done one of your, your very best episodes of your podcast, Amicus, with E. Jean Carroll and Robbie Kaplan, who, of course, you featured her in your amazing book. And I think that's the first place I really heard about her. Tell me about these two and and why what they're doing together matters so much. I I mean, Robbie Kaplan, I've known for a long time. Um, And, uh, you know, she sort of is is Supreme Court famous because she argued the Edie Windsor case, which was the case that at the end of the day got rid of the Defense of Marriage Act, which was the precursor to getting us to Obergefell and marriage equality in this country. And, you know, that in and of itself was heroic because she took that case all the way to the Supreme Court. Um, Folks who don't know the inner workings of the Supreme Court know that by the time you're at the U.S. Supreme Court, somebody else is generally telling you not to argue your own case, even if you've had it all the way from the lower courts, because there's just a handful of Harlem Globetrotters who do all the oral arguments at the court. But Robbie did it and she won it and she essentially said the line that Justice Kennedy used in his opinion about how time blinds us to justice, uh, to inequality and to dignity. So like, were Robbie Kaplan to have stopped there and just, you know, taken up weaving, it would have been enough. But she was also the person, and this is how she made her way into my book, who when the white supremacists and Nazis invaded Charlottesville in 2017, And uh, it was very, very clear that the Jeff Sessions Justice Department was not going to do anything about it as an incident of race hatred. Uh, Robbie just kind of helicoptered in with Karen Dunn and brought the civil lawsuit that brought all of the white supremacists and Nazis and Klansmen and Proud Boys to justice. That too could have really been enough. At that point, she really could have just taken off and gone to an island and drank mojitos. But instead, uh, she comes roaring out and does the E. Jean Carroll defamation lawsuit, which is essentially the lawsuit that, you know, a week uh, and a bit ago ended in this massive, massive judgment, $5 million uh, from a unanimous jury finding that Donald Trump had committed uh, sexual abuse of uh, E. Jean Carroll, but also had defamed her. And so Robbie Kaplan is in some sense, I used to call her, you know, the attorney general of the resistance, but she's just one of those people who, when there's no grown up in the room, Robbie just says, okay, I guess I'll do it. She's amazing. And obviously so is E. Jean Carroll. Why why was E. Jean Carroll the right person for this horrible situation and, and case? So, you know, E. Jean is an amazing character for folks who don't know the backstory. She was a kind of legendary gonzo journalist, you know, in the 80s and 90s. She had this amazing Ask E. Jean column that a lot of women my age grew up reading. That was the advice column. And um, Donald Trump allegedly um, came up to her in Bergdorf Goodman in the 90s, um, kind of assaulted her in a change room. And she didn't said nothing about it for a very long time uh, until after the advent of the Me Too movement. And I know you and I have talked about that a lot. uh, She wrote a book. And one of the chapters of the book, and it was about men who had been bastards to her. And one of her chapters really detailed this incident. And Donald Trump's response was, to defame her was to go after her and she suffered massive professional consequences. She was let go. She suffered incredible um, sort of public uh, opprobrium and people went after her. And so Robbie said, you know what, let's, let's sue the president for defamation. There's two parts of this lawsuit. It's a little bit technical. One of them is still hung up in a question uh, because it was defamation that Donald Trump committed while he was the president. That one is still pending. That's called Carol 1. Carol 2 was the suit that came after Trump had stepped down and defamed her again. That was the one that prevailed 
um, in a courtroom in Manhattan. One other thing I want to say, connecting Robbie and Eugene, that I only know because Robbie's wife mentioned it to me, and I think it's so beautiful, Pete. Uh, both Edie Windsor, who was, um, you know, decades older than Robbie Kaplan, and Eugene Carroll, who is significantly than older than Robbie Kaplan, are her plaintiffs in a world in which, as uh, Robbie's wife Rachel said to me last week, Robbie listens to older women. She listens to women who are in their 60s and 70s and 80s who are maybe invisible, and she vindicates their rights. And I love that as a theme here, that um, even E. Jean Carroll, who's in her 70s, even uh, Edie Windsor, who had been married for decades and was being insulted uh, by federal statutes that didn't recognize her marriage, um, that nobody sees them sometimes and nobody hears them. And then Robbie Kaplan steps in. And I just think that's such a beautiful theme for this moment because Donald Trump, as you know, from the Eugene Carroll deposition, confused Marla Maples, his wife, with Eugene Carroll in a photograph because all women look the same. To him. Unbelievable moment. I've watched that moment in that deposition several times uh, and really enjoyed it. That's a great point about the wisdom of older women. We always think about wisdom of older men and <clears throat> they always get heard their wisdom. But when I, I when I think about the wisdom of older women, American women, I think a lot about how they live through the time when abortion was illegal. And even conservative Republican women don't want to go back there often. And yet here we are. A person. <laughs> a great time to listen to the wisdom of older women on this issue. So wh where do you see where we are at on this in this country? It seems to be, I just talked to the great Liz Winstead, who's obviously an activist and, and, and constantly following this. Where are the courts on this? What's next? Are they coming for IVF, for uh, birth control, for Mifepristone? Where do you see this headed next with this conservative court? We're just in an inexplicable uh, legal moment where it is abundantly clear that every piece of data we have after the Dobbs ruling came down, whether it's all of those state referenda and ballot initiatives, whether it was uh, the special election in Wisconsin for a Supreme Court justice, which was a blowout for the justice who promised to protect reproductive rights, or whether it was the midterms, it is clear the electorate hates Dobbs and hates the idea of these hyper draconian bills that are, you know, six week bans. 15 week bans, uh, no exceptions. We hear, and here I have to just say, I'm impressed. Day after day after day, there's a story in the mainstream press of somebody who has been left to bleed out, you know, left to go septic in a parking lot. Uh, these extraordinary women in Texas, in Florida, who are telling their stories and saying, you know, I was forced to carry a pregnancy that almost killed me. Uh, that was not viable because of Dobbs. And so it has been a daily story. And in the face of that, state legislatures passing more and more and more punitive and draconian bans. I'll just say this week, in case people aren't clocking it, we have a young teenager in Nebraska who's pled guilty uh, to terminating her pregnancy. And her mom, uh, uh, they communicated by way of social media to get abortion medication. Her mom is now subject to years in prison. So this is happening every day. And yet state legislatures in the face of that just keep pushing these bans. So I am mystified. I don't understand, and this is, we have Ron DeSantis running for president thinking that the thing that's gonna make him super popular is um, being ever more punitive and cruel. And maybe just to answer your initial question, so many of the courts seem on board with that. And so we've got this fifth uh, circuit panel that's deciding the medication abortion case that was stayed by the US Supreme Court. Arguments in that panel last week were shocking in terms of the unwillingness to understand the human cost of doing away with Mifepristone. The justices on the Fifth Circuit unwilling to understand. Yes, the three judges hearing the case who were more upset that the um, Biden Justice Department hurt the feelings of Judge Kazmarek, the ninth, uh, the the uh, district court judge who tried to enjoy <laughs> the abortion pill nationwide. Um, 
and they were very upset at, at the language. That seemed to be the, the gist of it. So I think we're just in a collision course. I think we're in a collision course between public will and what an elect electorate that is allowed to vote wants to express. And these just highly gerrymandered red states and highly gerrymandered in different ways, federal and state courts that don't care. Yeah. And really the only question is, do we manage to allow democracy and voting to break through and fix that? Or are they poised to just so profoundly suppress democracy that it doesn't matter what the public wants? And, and that's where we are. Yeah. Huh. Uh, when it comes to the health of democracy, a lot of people are worried about this case that the Supreme Court shouldn't still be looking at it. Apparently, I, I, you know, it's hard to understand how jurisdictions work, but uh, the most important case, it would seem, would be more v. Harper, uh, this case that uh, has the independent state legislature out of North Carolina. Um, do you think that, that, that anything is going to happen with that or are they going to decide they don't have any standing like a lot of people are arguing and that this case is going to be seen as uh, moot? I guess that's the word. Yeah, I mean, this case is thermonuclear. It was when the court decided to hear it, it still is. And in very, very brief, it's a case that for the first time raises the proposition that state legislatures have plenary, which means completely unchecked power to do what they want with election practices and that state Supreme Courts have no jurisdiction to overturn them. And this is just a complete crack up because very recently when the Supreme Court got out of the uh, gerrymandering cases business, one of the things they said was, it's fine, state Supreme Courts can handle this. So for the Supreme Court to say, um, you know, now your state Supreme Court will manage it. And then only a few years later to have state Supreme Courts told that they are also benched. That's the case. And in some sense, it would give state legislatures in these gerrymandered red states absolute complete power over how elections go. And in the most extreme iteration of this case, it's a little bit edging up on what John Eastman was asking uh, the, the um, Trump White House to push for, which is, you know, send us your fake electors. All that matters is what the legislature says. Yeah. You're quite right. Because the North Carolina Supreme Court turned over, this case is now in some sense moot because the gerrymander itself is not problematic. The Supreme Court has asked for supplemental briefing in this case. And I think you're also right that the court may kick it away. Even before that happened, even before this mootness issue, it was clear from arguments at the court that they were not super, super psyched about doing something so utterly insane and without doctrinal basis, even if it didn't go away. So my best guess is this may not get decided by this court this term, but the idea that the court ever granted this case, as you say, is in and of itself preposterous. I have to ask you, Dahlia, about uh, Judge Gorsuch. He added a statement, which I guess is not a really a, a common thing, to the uh, Mayorkas v. Who is it? Uh, the case about Title 42, which dispensed of the immigration restrictions v. COVID. And this is getting a lot of attention, the statement that, that Gorsuch claimed that COVID public health measures may have been the greatest peacetime intrusions on civil liberties in American history. And obviously, a lot of people are reacting. Maybe he should get a history book to talk about the civil liberties against Japanese Americans or maybe slavery or, or Jim Crow. Nonetheless, what do you make of Judge Gorsuch's comments uh, that that uh, civil liberties have been infringed uh, at, at a rate he says executive officials across the country issued emergency decrees on a breathtaking scale and government governors and local leaders imposed lockdown orders, forcing people to remain in their homes. They shuttered businesses and schools. And he went on and on. And this statement is getting a lot of attention as to uh, what Gorsuch said about these covid restrictions. What do you make of it? I, I mean, I would commend to people, you know, Jamel Bowie had an amazing piece about it in The Times. Mark Stern had a great piece about it in Slate. Um, you're exactly right. Uh, apparently, Justice Gorsuch never heard of slavery, never heard of G G Jim Crow, never heard 
um, of uh, uh, the Japanese internment or the treatment of Native Americans in this country, every one of whom is a peacetime incursion on human liberty and dignity in many orders of magnitude worse than being asked to wear a mask. But I think two things are going on. One, we know Justice Gorsuch was one of the people who was affronted at the ways in which the early lockdown uh, directives offended religious groups who wanted to be able to gather without constraint. And he was one of the people who felt that that was an incursion on religious liberty. But more pointedly, and I think this goes to sort of bigger themes in the Supreme Court this year, Justice Gorsuch will never miss an opportunity to trash the administrative state. He will never miss an opportunity to say that all those government lawyers who are deciding your school policies, who are deciding your health policies, who are deciding environmental policies, they're all bad. It's a part of the conservative legal movement's larger project to dismantle the administrative state as we know it, to kind of do away with the regulatory state. All you need to do is go back and read his majority opinion in last year's case about Coach Kennedy, the praying coach on right. the 50-yard line, and the ways in which he trashes school attorneys who are just trying to accommodate the religious liberty interests of a coach and the demand, the directive that schools not impose, public schools not impose religion on students. And he talks about it as though these people are these mustache twisting, you know, evil gremlins who do want to do nothing but oppress religious actors. And I think this is of a piece with this larger assault, whether it's the major questions doctrine, whether it's the Chevron doctrine, it is a, a massive attempt by the conservative legal movement to do the thing that in some sense uh, the GOP has been doing for years, which is to say every single actor in the um, federal administrative state is a bad actor. Every person who regulates guns is lying. Every person who regulates health is a crook. Every single person whose work is to try to figure out how to make a yeah. big complicated country run is in bad faith. And Justice Gorsuch is chef's kiss, loves to perform that better than anyone. Well, at least he has a soft spot for Native Americans for some weird reason. Sometimes. Yep. Sometimes. Uh, so Slate is doing this really great series, week long series disorder in the court. You've been writing, you've contributed a couple pieces to this. But one you know, issue is how the court has been covered for years and treated differently, the uh, judicial branch than the executive or legislative branch by reporters. Where what do you tell me a little bit about about that piece, because as it relates to this issue with Harlan Crow and Justice Thomas, much less Ginny Thomas. Like we're learning way too much from investigative organizations like Pro Publica or Publica, however it's pronounced, and not enough from you know journalists who should be on the court beat, the Supreme Court beat. Like how are we learning these things now, and how is it the journalism been broken in terms of I think covering the Supreme Court or why? I think that for all of the best reasons, uh, Supreme Court coverage, including by me for many years, was more interested in the shifts in doctrine than in the institution itself. I think we just imputed good faith and good behavior to the justices long after it wasn't in evidence. We just took the position that our job was to translate what happened in that First Amendment case for for readers and some other entity was going to cover the court as a political branch. The best example I can give of this, Pete, is that I sat through a lot of confirmation hearings. Almost all of them are peopled by political reporters, Supreme Court confirmation hearings, because those are political events. Supreme Court reporters step in once you're on the bench and you're wearing a black robe. And then I think it's just very easy if you have that sort of imaginary wall of separation to say that all of the justices are just brains in vats. And what we're interested in doing is charting the course of the law. And part of the reason I wrote this piece is that I was deeply, deeply embarrassed when, as you say, ProPublica and Politico and The New York Times and every single mainstream media uh, entity was breaking stories about things that happened on our beat and things that happened in our beat in 2011 and 2012 and 2017 that we just thought, you know, that's for someone else to cover. And so I don't want this to be me maligning myself or the Supreme Court press corps. I think we are very academic at heart. But what has happened in that void 
when nobody was covering the court as a completely partisan bought and sold political institution is the stuff we are now seeing now with Harlan Crow, with Ginny Thomas <laughs> messaging Mark Meadows, with payments from Leonard Leo that go through Kellyanne Conway into Ginny Thomas's pocket. Like all that <laughs> happened on my beat. Yeah. And I didn't think it was my beat. Well, are you going to change your style? I mean, we've been, I mean, this whole package that we've put together this week has been an effort to say there's a bunch of things we need to do. We need to sort of widen the aperture and look more closely. And I also really want to say, like, from the bottom of my heart to the investigative reporters at ProPublica and Politico and the people who have added this to their beat. And I noted in my piece that a whole bunch of new um, jobs are being posted for people to come in and scrape data and look at papers and figure out the Supreme Court. I mean, I think like let a thousand flowers bloom. We all need to be doing this work. But holy cow, we are at like one minute before 12 on the Supreme Court legitimacy doomsday clock. And the fact that we're only starting to think about, hmm, maybe this is a partisan institution as designed is very chilling. Better late than never. Amen. Thank you very much for joining me. You are indispensable. I really appreciate all of what you're doing and I uh, hope to talk to you soon. Have a good time uh, at the at the DC event tonight. That sounds like uh, a lot of fun. So thank you. Thank you for having me. 